All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then we will dive in. So let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the time that we have. We pray your blessing upon it, upon us, as we uh, think together, reflect together. Pray that you would encourage us in our walk with you. Encourage us in our thinking about, about what it means for us to live out the life of discipleship in this time, in this place. We ask, God, that there would be a, a deep sense that you were with us and that you would guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Why don't we go ahead and shut off the AC if that's all right with everybody? Um, good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. This is uh, week two of our six week. I, I was asked to make it, it is six weeks. So uh, we're in week two. We'll have four more after this after this week. So uh, just so you know, mark your calendars. It's a, it's a six week series uh, this fall. Uh, it's said called Sabbath Church. Um, subtitled The Church and Power in a Post-Christian World. And uh, we'll be doing a little bit of review from last week. There are some folks who weren't here that will we'll get you caught up, and then we're gonna we're gonna dive in tonight to uh, defining and clarifying some terms. Uh, last week I led with this quote by Galadriel from The Lord of the Rings. Uh, the beginning of the movie it starts with this voiceover. It says, "The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air." Much that once was, is lost. And we're reflecting together this fall on what it is that has been lost, uh, and how we as the church are to respond to what it is that has been lost. Uh, as we are living in a time when for the church in the, the Western world in particular, uh, much of what we have known, much of what we have come to expect, what much of what we have anticipated, much of our understanding of how the world works and the role of the church in that world, much that once was is lost. And we started last week by reflecting on the end of Christendom. Uh, and I, I drew this up there. I filled it out just a little bit for us here this week. Um, so just a, a, a brief reminder of some ways of, of thinking about the, the relationship of the church to the world over the past 2,000 years. Obviously, uh, the time of Christ occurred during the Roman Empire, which established the early church. And the early church was very clearly a minority in the Roman Empire, right? No political power. You didn't go down to the local polling place and try to vote in a, a Christian Caesar. Right? You got the Caesar who was Caesar. That's the way that it worked. And so you had to, to sort out, learn what it means to follow Jesus in the context in which you are a minority. Or, using biblical language, the context in which you are an exile. There's a lot of this exilic language, of course, in the Old Testament, but it carries over into the New Testament. The church is understanding itself in that line of, of, of Israel as an, as an exiled people, of people who were sojourners. Think about this in Hebrews 11, the, the hall of faith, as we call it. It talks about there that these were people who were living for the city with foundations that they were on a journey towards, uh, that this world was not conceived by them to be the ultimate reality, to be their home, uh, to be something that they were shaping to their own ends. The world was the world, and they were living out their faithfulness to Jesus in the midst of that. Then, for lots of reasons uh, that we're not getting into, uh, the Roman Empire fell, and somebody had to step into the power vacuum, and it was the church that stepped into the power vacuum, which creates this roughly 1,500-year stretch of history called Christendom, 
which can be subdivided into a, f a few different historical periods, the medieval period, the reformation period, the enlightenment, and the post-enlightenment period, right? And this is, again, I, I was saying this last week, these are very rough numbers, but just for the sake of our conversation, uh, from about 500 to about the year 2000 is the time in the Western world of Christendom. And Christendom is defined as the time when the church in the state partnered to shape the culture. The church in the state partnered to continue. If there are any more Lord of the Rings fans in here, if I'm just the only dork. The church in the state partnered to rule them all. Right? To, to, to give meaning to the, the broader culture, to give purpose to the broader culture, to give a moral framework to the broader culture. That the church was deeply influential in a partnership with the state of shaping Christendom, this Western uh, European slash American <coughs> way of organizing the uh, the the culture. Um, what we're talking about is the idea that that is no longer the the reigning dominant way of being for the church in the world. That we find ourselves now living in post Christianity or post Christendom. And so the question that we're raising, the, the, the question that we're thinking about is, what does it look like to follow Jesus? What does it look like to be the church here? We're no longer here. We can wish we were here. We could, we could try to be here. We could try to make sure that the, the culture stays as we want it to stay. That ship has sailed. We're not here. We're here. And this is what we have to sort out. What does it look like to follow Jesus now? Post-Christianity, post-Christendom, what does it look like to follow Jesus now? Are you saying it started in 2000? Uh, I'm using that for a very, very rough uh, estimate. I think what, what I would say is that there are some cultural movements in the late 20th century that, that very clearly were, were kind of the, the end in America of the reign of Christendom. I think you can date it back to the 60s. You can date it back. It, that's, a, that's a whole other very, very long, long conversation. But just for the sake of our rough numbers, I'm saying approximately 500 to 2,000. I, I was going to complain that it took you so long to Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, Rob. <laughs> Still trying to figure it out myself. So. How does the end, so then the question is, how does the end of Christendom shape the way that we think of the relationship between the church and the culture? Last fall, for those of you who were involved in the Sabbath politics series that I did, we were thinking about this in terms of the relationship between the church and politics. Uh, this fall, we're, we're kind of broadening that out a little bit to the church and the, the culture around us. Politics is obviously a key part of that, and we will reflect on that a little bit together as we go through. But how does the end of Christendom, the reality that, that we are no longer living in the period that the church had come to expect, the church had power, the church had uh, certain authority in the culture, what does it mean for us to live now? in the end of Christendom, what is the relationship of the church and the culture? So this is what we're exploring together as we think about Sabbath church. We're thinking together about what does it mean? What is the church's way of being in the post-Christian world? When the assumptions of Christendom are gone, when the structures of Christendom are gone, uh, when the comfort of Christendom is gone, how should that shape our way of being in the world? What does this mean for our life together as the church, but also as this church? What does it mean? What does it mean for us? And one of the particular questions that I am interested in is this question. What is the relationship between the church and power? Because as we talked about last week, this gave the church power. This gave the church authority. And it's pretty easy to become addicted to power. It's pretty easy to become addicted to, to authority and, and comfortable 
with authority. Because in a lot of ways, it, it sure makes our life a lot easier, right? If the broader culture largely supports the way that we want to live, if the broader culture largely supports the way that we want to uh, 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 work and raise our kids and all those kinds of things, it, it, it becomes very, very tempting to want to hang on to that power. And so one of the key questions I think for us, for followers of Jesus in this space is, what is our relationship to power? And tonight we're going to be, we're going to be thinking about that, um, kind of starting into that question on what is the relationship of the church to power. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be teasing that out, looking at some particular powers and thinking of the relationship of the church to that. Sabbath, obviously, is a, is a key term. Um, it's in the, the very title of the series, Sabbath Church. I have come to the belief in my study of scripture and my reflections on the culture and my thinking about where we are as a church that Sabbath is a very important concept for us to understand biblically, to get our minds around, and to see, and what I would suggest is a, is a broader frame than how we have sometimes thought about Sabbath, which is a day a week that we're supposed to kick our feet up and rest. Right? That if it, it, we think about Sabbath in that way, that, that, that's certainly true. Uh, there is the biblical idea of the day a week of Sabbath. But I think theologically, biblically, Sabbath functions as broader, a broader concept that the day of Sabbath is a symbol of, but it's a broader concept. And uh, I spent a good chunk of last fall unpacking that. I've, I've preached uh, on it here and there, taught on it here and there in some other contexts. Uh, we went through it a bit last week. So let me just do some, some summation. I think the, the idea of Sabbath, as it is found in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, God's Sabbath rest is, is very important for us to understand. As we talked about last week, God's Sabbath rest doesn't mean that God took a nap. It doesn't mean that God had to himself kick, kick up his feet and have a rest. Sabbath is the condition in which everything is as it ought to be. So God created a world in which everything was as it ought to be. Humans were cared for. Humans had everything that they needed. Humans were provided for. Humans had intimate fellowship and relationship with God. Humans had intimate fellowship and relationship with each other. Humans were in a right relationship with the earth. We're in a right relationship with the world. And when it says that God's Sabbath, and that's the, that's the Hebrew term that is used, God's Sabbath, when it says that God's Sabbath, it means that God rested because everything was as it ought to be. His people were cared for. Uh, the, the world was as he intended it to be. The, the life that he created, the good life that he created, was in fact good. And so God Sabbaths, and therefore we Sabbath. Because when we are provided for, when everything is as it ought to be, when our relationships are, are intimate relationships that aren't broken by sin, that aren't broken by shame, when, when we do have to work in order to bring in what God provides, but God provides. We're not scraping a living for ourselves. We're not trying to make ends meet by ourselves. We go out. We take in what God has provided. That when, when God has provided for us and he has Sabbath rest, that means that we also have Sabbath rest. And so my, my suggestion is that Sabbath is a very important biblical concept for us to understand God's purposes for humanity and how we are called to live as those who belong to him, as those who live under his rule and under his reign. And so as we'll talk about this, um, I think the idea of Sabbath church points us in the direction of how we think about what it means for us to live <coughs> under the Sabbath reign of God now as we anticipate what's coming. It's not, the, the, the fullness of God's Sabbath reign is not here for the entirety of the creation yet, but we're the first fruits. We're the first fruits of God's Sabbath reign. And so we are called as the church to demonstrate to the world what it looks like to live as Sabbath people. And our relationships with one another and our relationships to the world around us, 
We are called to be the first fruits of the new Sabbath, the eternal Sabbath reign of God that is coming. All right. The church, people set apart to live a life of Sabbath in demonstration of God's good purpose and his provision for his people. Tonight, we got to define some terms. Because what I'm asking is, what's the relationship of the church to the culture? And what's the relationship of the church to power? And how should that affect the way that we think of our vision of ourselves, our mission as Sabbath people? And again, just a reminder, anytime you want to shoot up your hand and ask a question, feel free to do so. We will uh, uh, take the time that we need to, to interact with one another, to engage with one another. So I want to start into this uh, question now. What do we mean by culture? When we, when we say what is the relationship between the church and the culture, we have to give some definition to what the culture is. And then when we have that in mind, then that will lead us into the question of what do I mean by power? And, and, and how am I using the terminology of, of power? Okay? Any questions at this point? Comments? Thoughts? Doing all right? Pretty clear about what I'm doing, about what we're doing, for the most part? All right. I'm glad it is for you, because it's not entirely for me. So. <laughs> it's good to hear. Doug, yeah. I saw a speech by the person who was elected to um, replace Jeff Sessions. He didn't get the message about post-Christendom. No. <laughs> he did not. There's a lot who haven't. Okay. Yes. There's a lot who haven't. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just I think this is one of the great challenge. I'd say this is the great challenge for the American church, is to figure out what this looks like and to figure out how to build our life of the church on different foundations than, than as we've had it. And that's going to be long, and that's going to be hard, and that's going to be a, a very difficult process for us. It already is. A very difficult process for us. Some of the stuff we'll talk about a little bit later on, I'm going to start pointing at where I think some of the, the big challenges for the church are right now as we move through this. So we won't get it done in these six weeks? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, just not tonight. Okay. Yeah, no, I'll, we'll, we'll get it finished in six weeks, but yeah, just not not all of it tonight. you got to want to come back, right? you got to come back. We didn't want any more. Yeah, yeah. All right, so tonight, culture and power. What is culture? What is culture? Let me give you a definition, and I just want to interact around that, okay? So here's a, it's a fairly classic culture, of, a, a definition of culture. <clears throat> culture, the characteristics, values, and ideals of a particular community of people encompassing language, religion, cuisine, social habits, music, and arts. Okay. What do you think? What about economics? Economics is a is a uh, very good that should probably be on that list. We're gonna we're gonna talk a fair bit about that ourselves. So yeah, Medicine. economics. Medicine, absolutely. Law. Yep. Yep. I think social habits it, it captures some of that, but I think it's it's also good to to have those things uh, talked through. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Memory. History, the memory. Culture kind of goes back. Yep, to yep, absolutely. Yeah, I think history, shared history, shared memory is an important part of that. Okay. What do you think about characteristics, values, and ideals? We kind of looked at the, the <laughs> list of, of different topics, but, but characteristics, values, and ideals. What do you think about that? not a trick question. You can say I love it. That's great. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I don't have something I'm going to pounce on you with here. So, yeah, Rick. I think one of the distinguishing things about the current secular culture in the United States <laughs> is um, the, the width of some of those measuring sticks. Okay. Um, how wide they go from, from one extreme to another extreme. In some cultures, it's yeah. pretty narrow. Everybody believes the same thing. Right. Um, right. In our right. culture, it's become it's pretty Very wide. High. And, and um, I do think uh, one of the, I think one of the fascinating 
uh, historical events that we're seeing now is the question, what is the American culture? That's playing out right now, everywhere. It's playing out at football fields on Sundays. It's playing out in presidential tweets about football fields on Sundays. It played out in an election in Alabama yesterday. It's playing out everywhere in the American culture. This question of what is the American culture, this question that we'll, we'll wrestle with a little bit later on, what is our culture? Right? What does that mean? What can that, what can that possibly mean? Who is the our in the, our culture? I think that's where we have a hard time, where most people don't believe there's absolutes. Yeah. Culture's always changing, and yeah. think so we should just change. Yeah, culture yeah. shifts, so ideals shift. And, and if you look at it historically, there is <coughs> a lot of truth. Cultures do shift, right? Um, cultures are, by the definition themselves, not permanent. But what transcends culture into <laughs> what do we have reference that is transcended by which we would create culture? And that's a great. That's a great question. Leah, yeah. Okay. Question was cultural. Is that starting with your parents? So that's a great. Let's let's now let's now. Can I jump on something here? Because we'll we'll talk about that. Okay. So there's a lot of cultures in all of our life. There are a lot of cultures that we're a part of. Right. There's a broader culture. The nation to which we are citizens or or, or where we live. Uh, our ethnicity. Uh, I think Doug, you mentioned memory, history. You know, to what history do we do we see ourselves in, in a line of that has that has shaped us, that has shaped our, our 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 broader culture. But then you get into subcultures or smaller cultures, and, and there's lots of different, innumerable subcultures in any broad culture, right? Your family culture. So we get to your, your question. Yeah, family culture is huge. Family culture shapes us dramatically, right? And we don't get to choose that. We are born into a culture, and that culture has effects on us that we spend the rest of our life trying to figure out how that family culture shaped me and what that, what that meant for me. Um, so you have family culture. You have Minnesotan culture. Right? When Mindy and I moved here in 2005, we had a friend we went to college with. She was from Minnesota. She got us the book, How to Speak Minnesotan. You all know that book, right? It's a funny book, but it's also a cultural study. <laughs> it is absolutely a cultural study. And there are things that, because we had that book, we could pick up on. Like, I knew what hot dish was. Before this, before I moved to Minnesota, I, I never knew what hot dish was. I, I knew when the kid said, duck, duck, gray duck, what that was all about. Uh, because you know you're the only people on the face of the earth who say duck, duck, gray duck, right? Right? Yeah, it's duck, duck, goose everywhere else. So, um, so that's a that's a cultural thing. We learned what oh for cute meant and all this kind of stuff, right? The the the, the, the Minnesotan culture is a is a culture, uh, and there's some distinctives to that culture that people who move here from outside of here have to make some adjustments to and figuring out what that what that looks like. Culture of you two fans, like me, for instance. There's a, a particular affinity for the music. There's a particular culture. It would shape clothes you wear, shape the kinds of things that you, you listen to, spend your money on. The culture of car guys, right? There's car guys, and car guys hang out together. And I'm not a car guy, so I can't hang out with car guys. I'm, I'm an outsider to the car guy culture. But there's very clearly a car guy culture. There's a runner's culture. There are people who are runners, and, and that's very much a part of who they are. And they, they bind together with other runners, and they have a, a culture amongst themselves. You left there are DIY. Dallas Cowboys fans. Uh, yeah, what you say? You left DIY. DIY, yeah, I'm also not a part of that one. Definitely not a part of that one. I am part of this one. I am part of the Dallas Cowboys fans culture. Yes, I know, I know, I know. Not, not all, all cultures are, are uh, equally um, good for you, and that's probably one that's, that's probably not good. But, so, so we talked about culture, characteristic values, ideals of a particular community of people, broader cultures, but also getting into more microcultures, subcultures. So we're all interacting with different cultures in our life every day, 
aren't we? Like when we go to work, there's a, there's a work culture. When we go home, there's a family culture. Uh, when we go to the Vikings game, there's a football culture. When we're always kind of moving in and out of different cultures in our, in our daily life. We're shaped particularly by some of those. Uh, the family culture, I think, is, is really important. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people have a, a, a very difficult time because they don't understand how their family culture has shaped them. I think for most humans, your national culture becomes a very important part of how you understand yourself, your place in the world, and, and, and what you are to value. The national culture is very, very important, right? So there's some that you kind of can opt in and out of. I, I could theoretically, I guess, decide not to be a Dallas Cowboys fan tomorrow. I could switch my allegiance to the Minnesota Vikings and become a Vikings fan. I guess, or, what's that? But your wife would hate you. But Mindy would not be proud of me if that happened. <laughs> uh, I guess theoretically I could become a car guy. Uh, it's very unlikely that would happen. But I can opt in and out of those. Right? My family culture is my family culture. Uh, my national culture is my national culture. And these are things that get into us early, right? And, and, and we, we oftentimes won't be reflective about them. And so they're just working in the background and they're shaping the way that we think, they're shaping the way that we act, they're shaping the way that we think about who we are and how, how we are uh, to be in the world. Mindy, and then we'll go back to Andy. <laughs> when you were talking about national culture, I just was reflecting on, I was in Ukraine and the mid 90s and they took us to a like a Ukrainian culture museum and they were showing all this national dress and all telling us about all these dances they did and music they listened to and and they said like you know this is our national culture like what's American culture and we all looked at each other and we were like or like what is American national dress and we all looked at each other and they said like blue jeans and yeah. cowboy boots and we were like well no, I don't know, you know, but it it does feel awkward because you don't really know what is the national culture. Right. We're a melting pot, and I think that's it, it, we are. There, there's a, I can't I can't remember the name of it right now. I'll have it for you next week. But there's a, a book that talks about the eleven Americas. Hmm. That there are eleven regional Americas, and one of the things that's going on in the world today is that those eleven Americas are are trying to figure out how we are in conflict with each other and what that looks like moving forward. Um, and I can't I can't remember the title of it right now. But I'll I'll track that down. Just don't tell them it's blue jeans with wicks in them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have that. Huh? Crazy. It's clearly a plaid shirt, though. That's yeah. very clearly the American <laughs> the American dress. So yeah, Andy. Well, I was just gonna comment. On, you said it impacts you so early. Mm -hmm. Now we see that in our four kids. Yeah. So Maria. Yeah. Is very very modest, which is really Filipino. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go to the Y and she's got to have a t-shirt yeah. on. Yeah. Christine is not quite so concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Now in America are definitely more American. Right. Just right. in general on the way they approach things. But, so yeah, and, fascinating. And you're four kids and to was see those. And nine, almost ten when she came here. Yeah. yeah. So already by that time there's a certain amount of grade. And there's no way she could have ever enunciated that. And maybe couldn't even now. Right? But it's there. It gets wired into us. Yeah. I Jan, think another yeah. thing is too. People will say to you, "Did you have a normal childhood?" I'd say, "What's normal?" Right. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. Yeah. It was normal <laughs> for me. Yeah. Exactly. It's the only one I had. So <laughs> that's what I got. <laughs> yeah. I want to. I want to um, now ask this question of what is culture. Give a little more definition by by using a phrase. It's kind of a a classic culture definition phrase. It goes back into the ancient world. It was used by St. Augustine. It's common objects of love. Common objects of love. And what, what, what this says is that a, a culture consists of a community of people who share defined common objects of love. Things that we agree together are important. Things that, that we agree together are ideals that we want to live out. Things that we agree together are values that we want to instill in people who belong to our culture. Common objects of love. What do we love? What do we value? 
what do we want to shape the way that we live? What do we want to give us goals of how we live, purpose of how we live, and how that shapes us as a culture? These common objects carry with them meaning. They carry with them purpose. They carry with them stories. Stories that tell us about who we are and what we're about and where we've come from and where we're, we're going as a, a people. And again, you can define this at the micro level or at the macro level, right? As a Dallas Cowboys fan, I've got stories of the 94 Super Bowl and watching the 1994 Super Bowl. <laughs> and it's really fun to win a Super Bowl. You guys should try it sometime. It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really great. You're good, you got it. <laughs> But no, I, I mean, there are stories, and I can get with other Dallas Cowboys fans, and we can tell stories about Emmitt Smith and Michael Irvin and these kinds of things, right? And these stories have meaning for us. And then, they, and then it, it, it highlights the crushing nature of the fact that we've won two playoff games in the last 20 years. And, you know, so you can commiserate. But there are, there are stories there that shape. There's the mythology. There's the narrative of who we are. And we have that at a state level. We have that at a national level. Whatever nationality we're from, we have those national stories. We have, you know, in, in, for me growing up as a, a white kid in suburban America, the national stories were George Washington cutting down the cherry tree and the Battle of Gettysburg and these kinds of things, right? That are the, 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 the myth, and I don't mean myth as in false, I just mean they take on this mythical nature of the stories that tell us the values of our culture, which carry with them common objects of love. So, uh, we don't just list out the common objects of love. We do do that some, but we also embed those in the stories that we tell and that have shaped the way that we think about who we are. So let's just think for a minute. Common objects of the United States of America. In fact, if we were just going to put a, a list on the board, I've taken up most of the room on the board, so I'm not going to do that. But if we're going to put a list on the board, what are the common objects of the United States, common objects of love of the United States of America? What do you think? The flag. And this is what the flag symbolizes. Yep. The eagle. The eagle. Yep. Yeah, hearts. Valentine's. <laughs> yeah, hearts. Yeah. I have a little explanation. I okay. watched a movie last night, Bridge of Spies. Uh huh. The yes. Tom Hanks character says yeah. to the CIA character, uh, "You're Irish. No, you're German, based on his last name." Yeah. Tom Hanks character says, "I'm Irish, on both sides, but yet we are both Americans. Yeah. What is? What makes us American?" And you know, the CIA guy didn't know. You're right. Couldn't enunciate it. Yes. Yeah. But. Tom Hanks said, it's, um, oh, the CIA guy said, forget about the rules. You're going to eat in East Berlin, forget about mm, the rules. Right. Tom Hanks said, no, the rule is. What makes. Yeah, and he's, that, that's code for the Constitution. And right. he explains that. It is what makes us. We, that's, and that's, that was his common denominator. This yeah. is kind of interesting that we're yeah. talking about yeah. that now. Yeah. Because they're in a movie, Joel and Ethan Cohen. Right. Put right. that dialogue in. in there. Yeah. That's what it is to be American. Yeah. Yeah. This is my maybe name. not so much now, but how about the uh, family dinner okay. table? Family dinner table. Yeah. Yeah. Andy. Big cars. Big cars. <laughs> Big Cadillacs. <laughs> independence. Independence. The idea of the ideal. The idea of independence. And someone said the eagle. What does the eagle symbolize, right? It's not just an eagle. There's there's a meaning to the eagle. What does the eagle symbolize? Strength, power. Strength, power. Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. Right. Ben Franklin freedom wanted a turkey. He wanted a turkey. <laughs> yeah, he did. That would have been a good choice. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, the, the, the freedom, I mean, the, the eagle is a symbol of something, right? It, it carries an ideal with it. It tells a story. You know? Anything else? Apple pie. Apple pie. <laughs> And again, what what is that? What's the symbol there? Comfort. Comfort. Yeah. Home. Baseball. I think baseball. Yeah. Yeah. Democracy. Uh, equality. You know the the language that we that we use. Used to be Christianity. 
it, it, there, Christianity was certainly very much tied up in all of that back then. Yeah. Yep. Did you say uh, opportunity? Opportunity. I would say kind of like the Western lifestyle. Like yeah. How way did type of thing? Yep. Where yep. You're, you're your own person. Somebody said independence. Yeah. It fits in that category. The West. The West. The West is a mythic thing in the history of the United States. Right. And that, I tied in with that as this kind of can do it idea that we're going to build the Hoover Dam, so let's just do it. Right. You know, right. And, and the Golden Gate, I mean, back in the 30s, that was. Yep. And our state so building, cool, all that kind of stuff. Symbols of power. Statue Symbols of, of ability. Liberty. Freedom. Yeah. Now, of course, um, we're not going to get into this a whole lot tonight, but um, there are, of course, people who are on the wrong side of some of these things in the history of the United States. It is a part of what we're seeing being played out in our culture today. Is how do we wrestle with that part of our history? What, is that, what does that mean? When not everybody had the experience of freedom, liberty. Uh, not everybody had these, these things as the way I would have growing up. That these would have been held up as values that I could resonate with. They made sense. For other people, they didn't make a whole lot of sense because their experience was quite different than the symbols. Or That's part of the national uh, working out of of culture, where they had stories and objects that were that were different. taken from them. Yep. Oh yeah. Yes. Absolutely. They were taken from them. <clears throat> okay. Let's keep going with this. So, common objects of love. Thinking about that. Have that in mind as we turn now to thinking about s a Sabbath culture. Going back into the scriptures. Go back into Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis. Genesis one and two. Like what you see going on in the early chapters of Genesis is that the, the love of Yahweh, the love of the Creator God, is what binds Adam and Eve to God. Right? What binds Adam and Eve to each other. What binds Adam and Eve to the earth, the earth, the creation. The life of Adam and, of Adam and Eve is a life lived with Yahweh at the center, or another way we could put it, Yahweh was the common object of love. The Creator God was the common object of love in the Garden of Eden. He was the center of life. He was the meaning of life. He was the purpose of life. He was what determined meaning and purpose. He was the one who spoke to Adam and Eve about who they were, what they were about, what their way of life was to be in the world. He defined that. And so Yahweh was at the center. And so thinking of our, our theme of Sabbath, Sabbath is the state of being for humans when Yahweh is the common object of love. When, when Yahweh, the creator God, the provider, the giver of life, when Yahweh is the common object of love, when Yahweh is the one who is the object of the affections of our heart, the one who we love, the one who we desire, the one who we seek to obey, when Yahweh is at the center of our life, the condition of life is Sabbath. It's rest being provided for, being in right relationship with. A relationship that's not broken. A relationship with Yahweh that's not broken. A relationship with the other. Adam and Eve that's not broken. A relationship with the earth, with the world that's not broken. Sabbath is the state of being when Yahweh is the common object of love. Humans from the very beginning, of course, are created to live in community. When God creates Adam, when God creates everything else in Genesis 1, he says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. When he creates Adam, what does he say? It's not good for Adam to be alone. It's not complete. It's not finished. It takes Adam and Eve, it takes the male and the female to be complete, to be human. Humans are created to live in community. And because of that, humans are created to be encultured. 
we, we can't be people who don't have culture. Culture is a necessity of being human. It's, 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 it's a, it, it's, it's imp- it would be impossible to be human without culture, without stories, without meaning, without purpose. It's impossible to be human without being enculturated, people who are products of culture, shaped by culture. That is inevitable. To be a created being, to be an earthly being, to be in relationship with others, is to be one who is shaped by culture. Culture, therefore, is a part of God's good creation. It's essential to God's good creation. But, culture only functions properly as intended by God And humans, therefore, only experience God's good, the fullness of the goodness of God, as he created that to uh, us to experience that. We only experience divine, divinely given culture, and therefore divinely given life, when Yahweh is the common object of love. Anything replaces Yahweh as the common object of love. There's still culture, But now it's no longer culture as intended by God. Now it becomes culture as created by humans who no longer hold Yahweh as the common object of our love. And if we don't hold Yahweh as the common object of our love, what happens? We replace Yahweh with all kinds of other stuff. Right? We replace Yahweh with all kinds of other things. And cultures are created by defining what your common object of love is. And post-Eden, what I called last year in the, in the Sabbath politics course, life east of Eden. Life east of Eden is enculturated, but now Yahweh is no longer the common object of love of cultures. And so all kinds of other ideals become the common object of love. <clears throat> So, this is the question. What happens if Yahweh is replaced as the common object of our love? And this is what we see as we follow the biblical story through. And we're not going to get into it tonight. um, But the false common objects become apparent in human history. And you see this Genesis 3, Genesis 11. Of course, it goes up well beyond Genesis 11. It goes up to today. Um, But I think this is a fascinating read of what's going on in Genesis 3 to 11. It's the formation of cultures in which Yahweh is no longer the center. And it describes what happens to human beings in the formation of cultures in which Yahweh is no longer the common object of love. The Bible doesn't use that language of common object of love, but that's what we see happening there. Doug? I I heard once that to be human is is three things. culture, art, language, and then we're the only species that kills its own. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, apart from, I think there's some like monkey that... Yeah, you know, yeah. But, A few. Uh, what happened yeah. in the first few chapters of Genesis? Yeah. Murder. Murder. A fratricide murder Genesis on four. top of that. Yeah. yeah. And um, they, it kind of is, a, Put it up here. is a, an happens. illustration of what you... Yeah. What you're talking about right yeah. now. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And I, and I said this last fall, I said this last week, uh, and we're not going to spend time on it tonight, but I do think Cain is such a very important symbol of, of, of this. Cain is the symbol of humanity and sin. Uh, and everything from there is playing out the life of Cain, of what Cainite life looks like. Not Canaanite, that's a different thing. Cainite life. Right? And, and, and so Genesis 3 leads to Genesis 4, which leads to the flood, which leads to Noah, who we like to think is a good guy, but he does some pretty screwy stuff and gets in trouble with God too, which then leads <laughs> on to the Tower of Babel. Uh, and Janet, I think you pointed out last week, we were te- talking about technology, about how that's a symbol of so much of what we see in the world around us too. I think that Cain, Tower of Babel, symbolism in the first few chapters of Genesis 
is so descriptive of the East of Eden world, and though our context has changed dramatically since Cain was wandering East of Eden, and we've quote unquote developed since then, uh, the symbols are still very rich, very, very rich for us. So we see this story of human cultures starting to form in which Yahweh is not the common object of our love and what that means for human life. And let's just think about this a little bit. East of Eden cultures that unite around common objects other than Yahweh, we've been talking about. Now you get competition between cultures, competition between brothers, Cain and Abel. But then as that plays out, you get competition between cultures. You start the violence of one culture fighting against another culture. Uh, war starts to come into human history uh, as my culture seeks to establish itself over against your culture as our people seek to establish ourselves, because we need to get the resources, and there's competition for the resources. Or we need to think that we're the greatest. We need to think that our culture is better than your culture, and we need to prove that to you through technological superiority, through economic superiority, the competition of, of human being that comes in, and that competition between cultures. Culture idolatry. The, the, the idolatry of our own culture and the worship of our own culture as we're the greatest culture our culture is better than your culture culture striving striving for power, striving for prestige again, striving for resources right? in, in, in early days we have competition for fertile land in the 20th and 21st century you have competition for fertile land one of the things that drove Hitler was his pursuit of what he called Lebensraum. You know what that means? You know what it means, Andy, right? Living room. We need a living room. We, we need a room to support our people. And so that's why he wanted to go into, this, into Russia, was they had lots of living room. And the Germans needed it in order to become who they wanted to become. So competition, striving, idolatry, the breaking of Sabbath. It's the breaking of Sabbath. At a cultural level, we see the breaking of Sabbath. Cultures now must protect her common objects of love. I've got to protect my common objects. Whether those be ideas or stories or whatever they are, now we have to protect our common objects. How? How do we protect our common objects? Now we move from culture to power. How do we protect our common objects? Power. When Mindy was pregnant with Bethany, uh, we were in England at the time. Bethany was 11 days late being born. First child, and I'm sure it was hard for Mindy, but it was really hard for me. <laughs> uh, waiting, anticipating. And, and I'm not a computer game guy, but I bought this computer game. It was one of those build your own civilization computer games, right? Where you start off and you're just this tiny little tribe and there's other little tribes around you and you have to go to battle against them and you have to get resources and then you, you bring them into your own culture and you expand your way out, you expand your way out and you have to build your military, you have to build your economic resources, you have to build your te technological resources because in order to sustain your culture, you have to have power. You have to have power to sustain your culture. And so now we have to dig into this question, what, what is power? <laughs> what is power? So let's, let's think a little bit about, about power. Again, another definition, you, you have it on your sheets there. The way that uh, I'm defining power here, the ability to influence people, events, or institutions toward desired ends. The ability to influence people, events, or institutions toward desired ends. And you have multiple levels of power, but just a couple to point out. You have personal power, the influence 
of an individual over others. All of us have some level of personal power and our, our influence of uh, over other people. Institutional power, the influence of an institution, or excuse me, the influence an institution has to direct people towards certain ends, to shape people as a particular kind of people who want to pursue certain ends. So we can think about lots of different institutions here. You can think about companies, you can think about governments, you can think about churches, you can think about lots of different kinds of things. Apple, right? Apple wants to shape me toward the particular end of wanting to buy more Apple products. And so there's an institutional power that Apple is, is, is searching for, that Apple desires to have. Because the more institutional power Apple has, that means the more people they have who are buying their products. Because they have certain ends. What's the end of Apple? Profit. Profit, right? And they need me to buy their products in order to achieve that end. And so the institutional power of Apple is the influence that they have to direct me to buy this. The components of power. We'll talk about this a little bit just then. An end, a goal. What is the goal to which we want to direct people? Apple wants to direct people towards going to the Apple store and buying a phone. Power seeks to direct people towards ends. A rationale by which people are convinced to move toward that end. Apple promises me that I have their phone, my life is going to be awesome. Right? Uh, I'm going to, all my, all my dreams are going to come true, I'm going to have all my life organized, I'm going to be able to, I, I won't have a minute where I'm bored because I, I've got this, this thing with me, I can, I can always, what's that? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Well, we, we, I, I continue to buy new ones, right? So <laughs> I continue to buy the promise, but a rationale, a rationale by which people are convinced to move towards a particular end. And influencers, who are the influencers whose position is to move people towards that given end? Again, Apple, Steve Jobs standing up on the stage in California every year or so, about to launch the new great thing that Apple, you've, you've seen videos of these, right? All the, the people in the audience are just buzzing with excitement, waiting for what Steve Jobs has next. And he always had this great, Steve Jobs was great at this. He was great at, at communicating to this. Because he always would tell people what they were doing, and then he would think he was just about done, and then he would always say the same line. He would say, oh, and there's one more thing. And then that one more thing was the thing. Right? And people were going crazy when he would say, oh, and there's one more thing. He built this liturgy, he built this structure around how to do it to capture people's hearts. An influencer who influences people, or a group of influencers, or a community of influencers who influence other people <coughs> to buy into, to go towards the end that we are, are pursuing. Now let's think about cultural power. We talked about personal power and institutional power. Those, of course, are a part of this. But let, let's think a little bit about cultural power. Cultural power, the ability to enact, enforce, and protect our common objects. The ability to enact, enforce, and protect <coughs> our common objects. So, we all, whatever culture we're a part of, there's a common object or a set of common objects. What we want to do is make those common objects real. We want to live this out in reality. So we want to enact the common objects. We, we need to enforce the common objects, and we need to protect the common objects. Cultural power is embedded in institutions and persons whose job it is to protect the common objects. Institutions and individuals who 
whose job it is to protect the common objects, our common objects. So the first thing I thought was like the Queen of England, yep. the Parliament, yep. I mean the Brits are really good at having it. Show. And they're great at pomp and circumstance. The Queen's speech every year, it's amazing, yeah. right? Prime Minister's questions every week, we really it's amazing. Quite that in this you know, we have the State of the Union, we have some of these things. They're not quite as... The Brits have had a long time to perfect it, right? And they've got the costumes. Yeah. The Brits and the French have got it down. The Queen is a fascinating example of this. Because institutionally, she doesn't have power, right? She's, she, she cannot go to the parliament and say, I command you to do this. That was dealt with in the late 17th century when parliament took power from the monarch. But the queen is a symbol of the British people. Functionally, she really has, she has very little value, actually, if you step back and think about it. But the symbol is, is, is important. There's a symbol of the queen. There's a connection over history. It, she symbolizes us and, and, and who we are and our history. And then you have, you know, like the parliament and the, the uh, think, think about a law court also in Britain with the wigs and the robes and I mean all this stuff that has this very symbolic that, you know, just step back a second and think about a, a, a man or a woman sitting in a black robe with a wig like that on in the early 21st century America, or 20th century world. It's kind of weird when you stop and think about it, but we don't stop and think about it because it's a symbol that we have come to accept and it carries meaning with it. That meaning is a meaning of authority, law. Right? That wig has a, a, a meaning to it. And sometimes those enforcers are not visible. Right. In England, like in France, you go to great lengths to protect the French. Right. 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 So that is much, much subtler. Yeah. So you don't see it. But it's a cultural but it's, value. It's, it's very, very it's, an ob it's a common object of love. Oh, that and there, and, and there are structures to make sure that it remains a common object of love. Yep. All right. Um, you see this from tribal all the way to national cultures. Right. This idea that power is embedded in institutions and persons. You can see this from a, a small tribe living in uh, South America, that there are structures, there are powers, all the way up to the Queen, Parliament, the State of the Union Address, whatever it may be. All right, so let's just unpack these words just a little bit. Enact, create, and put into practice cultural norms that support and sustain our agreement on common objects. Again, let's think about the United States of America. Who are the enactors of our common objects of love? No, nope, the enactors, creators. Legislature. Go back, historically. Founding fathers. Founding fathers. George Washington, Ben Franklin, Alexander Hamilton. These are enactors who conceived of an idea of what the United States was to be. Thomas Jefferson, right, conceived of the idea of what this, this could look like, and then enacted it through war in order to free from British control, through the creation of documents that contain language that if you're an American, you know, right? We may not all be able to say the preamble, we may not all be able to say the Declaration of Independence, but we know the language. We declare these truths to be self-evident, i.e., if unless you're an idiot, you can see that this is true. <laughs> Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Enactors, people who conceive of the of the culture. And the U.S. history is a fascinating one because of how it was created in a very unique way. You know, you think of the, let's think of Britain again. You, you have cultural objects that develop over time. In the United States, there was an intense period of time where ideas were formulated, put on paper, and a country was created. That's interesting. That was the first time in history that had happened like that. It's happened since then. It was the first time it had happened like that. So we have clear creators, or excuse me, enactors, 
uh, of, of the common objects of love of the United States. Okay, enforcers. Training others to adopt our common objects as theirs. We have procedures in place by which to train young people in our culture to have common objects of love that are agreed upon by the culture. Schools. Schools, churches have been very much participators in, in this. A variety of different kinds of structures. Also, foreigners, immigrants, people who move here. This, of course, did not, I don't want to get into all of this, but one of the conversations that we're having, or one of the shouting matches that we're having in, in the United States right now is this question of who is who is us? What does it mean to be us? Uh, what, what should someone coming here from another country agree to? What should they know? Citizen tests? Should they speak English? These kinds of questions. These are enforcement questions, if I can put it that way. These are how to train people to desire the common objects that we desire, that we agree to. And if you agree to these common objects, then you're us. <clears throat> okay? Andy? Well, sometimes the, the, the first and the second generation of foreigners are the most American. Have the most? Are the first and second generation are the most American? Yeah, yeah. So, like, when I, what, I have, one of my grandmas was Finnish up on a ranch. They, you know, her family spoke Finn, well, they still, still do. And the other one was Danish, and they got the strap if they were caught speaking Danish as we are American. Right, right. <laughs> that's that's a, nothing, nothing Danish to It's a very common immigrant yep. tale of that first generation mm -hmm. seeking to become American, or wherever it is. Seeking to be like Uber American. Uber, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the second generation and third generation struggling to figure out who they are because they're they're not fully American. They're not fully from their parents' own, their their parents' background. So they're this third thing. There's this third sometimes, thing. Uh, sometimes foreigners are actually the enforcers. <laughs> That's true. Yes. That's true. And then uh, protectors. Defending our common objects against assaults of different common objects that might threaten ours. How do we protect our common objects from other common objects, other idea systems, other value systems that might come into conflict with ours? This is the, again, this is Europe. This is the, the immigrant influx into Europe. That's what this is. That's what Europe is wrestling with, of the Islamization of, of Europe. What do we do with that? What does it mean to be us? How do we live this out? Uh, who should be a part of us? And different European countries have reacted in different ways. And this has been causing a great deal of stress in Europe, in the EU, in Brexit. And all of this stuff that we've seen over the last couple years has been playing out on this. Should you have to agree with our common objects in order to live in our country? That's a big question. And I'm not here to answer that question tonight by any stretch. But I just want to show you that this cultural dynamic is playing out as we're watching it on the news. Rick. Yeah. Oh, just a little side note. Isn't it ironic that Germany, with its World War II, right. um, Hitler um, yeah. culture to be the most receptive of the of the old European nations to receive these immigrants. Is well, that I, ironic? I would suggest it's it's not it's not ironic. It makes a ton of sense for the Germans because they want to be everything but what Hitler was. So they're paying back. They are. They are. There's this sense of we 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 do not want to repeat that. We do not want to do that. And so the conversation in Germany then becomes, what is our history? What is our culture? Uh, how do we deal with that in our culture and how that shaped us? 
And, and if we don't want to repeat that, and we want to invite lots and lots of people in, then the question comes, what does it mean to be German? And they're really wrestling with that. Because there's a, there's a real guilt in the history <coughs> of what we did with what it meant to be German. And how that drove the way that we responded, the way that we pursued power. And we don't want to do that again. And I think this is a fascinating conversation that's happening in Germany, it's happening in France. It's happening in, in, in with the whole, the, the, the World War II shadow is still very much cast along in Europe. Oh, what does it mean to be us? Because we had these nationalisms that led to war after war after war after war. So now we want to be the EU, but how do you be the EU and also be German and also be French? And what does this mean? Right? So these are all cultural questions. These are common objects of love questions that are playing out. I'm going to have to push forward, Andy. I'll catch you afterwards. Does that sound good? I want, to, I want to get us out of here by by our appointed time, quarter till. So, so the institutions, the powers, we're gonna uh, dig into this a little bit more as we move forward through this series. Financial institutions are a significant part of a, of a culture, right? We haven't talked about the symbol, but you go to New York, you go to Wall Street, and you stand at, uh, at, at where, where Wall Street comes into, I can't remember what the cross street is there, but it's right by Trinity Church in Manhattan. What's standing there? What's the what's the statue? The bull. The bull. It symbolizes what? Bull market. Bull market. Right? Financial institutions have symbols of what we want to be about. Technological powers, technological we talked a little bit about that last week, we'll come back to that. Political, obviously. Military police law. This is one of the the, the questions that cultures have to deal with. Who has the right to use coercive violence? What's the difference between the military and the mafia? One's legal, one's not. But, if I can say it this way, they're both doing the same thing. They're both protecting common objects. We, as a people, say this particular branch or, or group has legal authority to do that. These don't. And so one of the questions of form of, of countries that are forming is always who has the right to use coercive violence. That's a fundamental culture question about how you protect your common objects. Museums is another one that's really important. Yeah, they keep, they keep us in front of us. Yeah. All right, so I want to leave you with a few questions here. What is our culture? What is our culture? And here's what I want you to be thinking about as we go this week. I need to define who our is. Because this is a really, really, really important culture question. When we say us, who are we talking about? When we say our, who are we talking about? What I want to do is suggest that as followers of Jesus, we have a very particular way that we need to be thinking about these questions. To what culture do followers of Jesus belong ultimately? To what culture do followers of Jesus belong ultimately? What are the common objects of love of the kingdom of God? What are the common objects of love of the church that binds us together? in a way that I would suggest should and must and is intended to transcend all other cultures. Family, unless you hate your mother, your brother, you cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> Nation, Dallas Cowboys, dare I say it? The kingdom of God is a culture. The church is a culture, and it's to transcend all other cultures. It doesn't remove us from our other cultures, but it must transcend those other cultures. And what if the common objects of love of the kingdom of God or the church are quite different than the common objects of a national culture? Or conflict with them. Or conflict with them. <clears throat> of a national culture, or a family culture, or a 
you name it. What if our common objects as followers of Jesus are quite different or are in conflict with the common objects of the majority culture in which we live? This leads to another question that we're going to be uh, unpacking next week. What is the relationship of the Sabbath church to instruments of worldly cultural power? What should our relationship be to money? Because money is a form of power. Right? What should our relationship be to money? What should our relationship be to technology? Which is a form of power. What should our relationship be to politics, law, force? And that's where we'll go to next week. We think about the church and power. And we're going to go back like we did last fall. We're going to go back into the Jesus and Pilate story. We'll spend a little time reflecting on, on that story, some other biblical stories, to help us think about the relationship of the church to power East of Eden powers, cultures, and what it means for us to be followers of Jesus who have the common object of love of the Messiah that is to bind us together. And, and which is to bind us together in a way that transcends all the other things that separate us. And that cause us to think that we're different from one another. The common object of love is Jesus. What does that look like for the church? All right? Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time. We do pray that you would bless us. We do pray that you would keep us. We pray that you would encourage us as we think about what it means to follow you. Make Jesus the common object of our love. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. 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 Just ironic how it's just happened.